stream. Excuse me. And make sure it's going to where I need it to go to. Stream, are you doing? Yes, great. Okay. Um, so today is uh, paper day. Um, I've got a nice stack of papers here so far. Uh, that's a good start. Um, for those of you that have not turned your paper in so far, uh, I know a fair few people already sent them in via email, and that's cool. Um, if you haven't given me your paper yet, uh, you can email it to me anytime today, counts as today. Um, if you're not able to get it in today, just get it into me as soon as you can. Um, technically, I'm supposed to take like 10 points off per day that it's late, but I've not really kept too strict on that. Just get it to me as soon as you can. Um, if you send it to me like at the end of November, I'm probably not going to be cool with that. <laughs> but you know, just get it to me. Um, because I tend not to grade too hard on these things. I know a paper is a lot more than just like coming in and taking a test. You need to actually do a little bit of research and a little bit of work. Um, but I'm not, I don't grade harshly on the test. So just, just get it done. Um, so yeah, if, for those of you that haven't physically turn, turned it in yet, just, just email it to me. Those of you online, just email it to me, obviously. Um, that's all I can think of. Anybody in here have any questions? Cool. Okay. Um, we've probably got a whole bunch of people in the library right now trying to fight the printers in there, so good luck to them. Um, as much as I do like having them printed out, it's not a requirement. It's just a major preference. <laughs> I mean, I am going to go to, like, the adjunct office right after, well, my other class today and print out what I can because that's just how I grade them, so... It's not a huge deal. It just makes things easier for me. Okay. Um, so let's get back to the notes. Uh, the way it's looking, we may be able to do the review next Monday and then take the test on Wednesday because uh, we're about halfway through the notes now. Um, and just based on like how quickly I was able to do stuff with my Tuesday, Thursday class, uh, we should be able to get close to the end today and then finish it up on Monday. So just, just FYI, um, which means I need to take your guys' test and like manually putting it, put it in online for my online students this weekend. So that'll be fun. In addition to all the stuff I've got to grade. Speaking of grading, uh, I'll get to your class's papers as soon as I can. So that's the answer to the question that will be coming next week is I'll get to the papers when I can. Um, so back to the notes. Uh, this is where we ended. Um, we had this whole back and forth across New York State uh, and down into Philadelphia, um, which eventually led to the Battle of Saratoga. Uh, and due in part to um, some delaying actions on the part of uh, General Herkimer. Herkimer? Herkimer. Uh, who headed off uh, General St. Ledger. Our Burgoyne was by himself in the Battle of Saratoga, which actually happened at, um, where is it at? Or does it not say? It was like at a, was that a farm? Where did I at? Uh, the Freeman's Farm, yeah. It's actually, oh, it's not on this one. Yeah, it's just here on the notes, Freeman's Farm. Um, it was technically the battle of, all well, right, I can't highlight stuff here because it just makes the thing. Yeah, so, um, Battle of Saratoga, which was considered a huge turning point victory for uh, the Continental Forces. 
And while there were a lot of folks involved, Horatio Gates, Benedict Arnold, Anita Allies, as well as the Green Mountain Boys, um, Benedict Arnold was the highest ranking officer there, so he was technically in charge. And though we know him for things he does later, um, he was as an extremely important uh, general for the Patriots and uh, led the, the battle here. So, some of the um, responses to Saratoga, uh, especially fall in the net in the slide after next. So, just keep this in mind. So, we mentioned I briefly mentioned Valley Forge, just kind of um, offhanded. So this is where the Continental Army was uh, in eastern Pennsylvania. And despite them having a couple of victories under their belts, they were still in the winter out in the middle of basically nowhere with hardly any supplies. And um, that's going to kill you pretty quick. And uh, discipline was... Um, going poorly as well. So the troops were pretty much ready to leave. I mean, you can win a battle, but if you are going to get killed by the winter, uh, that's not something you want to stick around for. However, we got some volunteers from Europe that wanted to see uh, Britain fail, so let's see some of these, some of these lads. Uh, the Prussian Baron Frederick von Steuben, who actually was recruited uh, directly by Benjamin Franklin. The French General uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who's extremely important, I'd argue um, right up there with Washington at, in terms of the importance in winning the war. Um, we don't talk so much about the Bavarian uh, John Baron de Kalb, or the Polish Thaddeus Krusko and Casimir Count Pulaski, um, all of whom were important in recruitment, uh, getting money in, as well as supplies. Uh, so we had, we had folks from all over Europe coming in to, to help out. But this wasn't quite, like, it's not like Bavaria was joining in the war. These were just some, you know, rich dudes from Bavaria who decided, hey, you know, we also don't like England because nobody in, in, in Europe liked England. So, um, as we had mentioned before, uh, the women didn't just like sit home and not get involved at all. Uh, with the ties of the war changing, many women were forced out of their homes, depending on which side they supported and which side was, was taking what city. Um, and the women who were involved with the troops, of course, faced the same supply shortage as they did because, I mean, you're there with the troops, and if they don't have supplies, you don't have supplies. Um, some women actually... Uh, work as spies or couriers for either side because again you're in this era of uh, make sure this on okay it's like oh well they're just women they they can't be doing anything uh, using their brain how they they couldn't be spying uh, Lydia Dara though proved them wrong. Um, some British officers just like occupied her house and decided, hey, we're staying here and using your house and also we're just going to openly talk about plans we have of assassinating Washington. And um, she happened to know where Washington was, so after she heard their plans, she just like strolled out of the house and went and found Washington. It's like, hey, uh, so I heard some guys 
talking about killing you, you might want to do something about that. We had Nancy Hart Morgan. Um, she specifically lured uh, British soldiers to dinner while they were having a good time. She hid their guns, shot two of them, uh, and then the neighbors came along and hung the rest of them. I guess hanged is the correct term. Uh, we did have Margaret Corbin. So there's this this single mythological figure known as Molly Pitcher. Um, in the front lines of, of this era of battle, the it was very easy to get dehydrated because you know you were you're firing uh, you know black powder muskets and the cannons and they were it was causing a lot of heat and you're running around wearing all this heavy stuff and you know again the guns like 40 pounds so it's very easy to just like overheat or get dehydrated and just pass out in the middle of battle um, so the camp followers who were along with the men would often literally just like form a line between the front lines and the uh, or you know go back and forth between the front lines and the supplies and bring pitchers of water to the front line to keep the men from passing out and Molly Corbin was one of these so-called Molly pitchers uh, who would you know keep the men from passing out from heat exhaustion well, at one point, her husband um, was hit with shrapnel or something, or perhaps even a, uh, a musket round, but it's, it's a musket ball. It doesn't travel especially fast, so it's not immediately going to kill you. Um, so she took his place, and his place in the front line was loading and firing cannons. So she started loading and firing cannons because, I mean... You don't exactly need special training for that. You just watch somebody do it for long enough. It's like, yeah, no, I can do this. And then uh, my favorite one, Margaret Sampson, um, or Deborah Sampson, I'm sorry. I got the two mixed up. Deborah Sampson, um, she just went the extra step and straight up disguised herself as a man and fought as a soldier um, to the extent that she got a captain's commission. Um... And when she was injured in battle and they finally discovered that uh, she was, in fact, a woman, they're like, okay, well, we're going to discharge you, but we're going to write down it was because of injury, so you're getting an honorable discharge and a captain's pension. So thanks for helping us in the war. So it wasn't like some Mulan thing. We're like, oh, well, we're going to put you to death because you're not supposed to be helping us. It's like, no, thanks for the help. You've been injured. Go be a, a veteran with a captain's commission. So, yeah, Deborah Sampson was, uh, was something else. So I've got images here. have got Valley Forge. Um... Valley Forge with the with the boys. I think the one in green there is Pulaski. What is the um, or no? I think the one in green is the Bavarian, uh, Baron von Cobb. Then you have Lydia Dara. It's like, oh, don't mind me. I'll just stand here in the corner and listen to you guys talking about your plans. Don't, don't, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not even here. And so again, like the eavesdropping, it wasn't like she was standing in the doorway being all sneaky. She was just there, and they were talking about what their plans were because, you know. British generals weren't weren't concerned at all about what a woman might hear. Um, taking that a step further, we had Nancy Hart Morgan. Really like this picture. 
Like, no, we're gonna, I'm gonna shoot you. Like, oh shit. There you have Margaret Corbin getting that cannon ready to fire. Her husband's sacked out on the ground. He's had enough. And then finally, we have Deborah Sampson. Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, there was a lot going on. Uh, now, this is just on the Patriot side. Obviously, you can um, find similar stories uh, for the, the Loyalist side as well. But, you know, obviously, this book's going to be a little bit biased. In fact, I need to pull my book out. I'm usually following along with my book, but I've got so many papers in here. Okay. Do, 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 do. All right. Jersey, critical assistance. Oh. Why does it... There's so many... But things between Saratoga and the thing that Saratoga is really important for. Wish she didn't do that. Anyway. Okay. Um, so the home front was bad too, as we mentioned. Um, spots on the home front were scarce. Uh, women working on farms had to obviously learn to work the fields, which, as we had mentioned before, um, were typically not where women work on the farms. I mean, they, they work parts of the farms, but not like the big open fields. Um, oftentimes, though, families had to scavenge or simply like loot the remains of cities to survive. Uh, the big danger, which is something that I brought up in an earlier slide, um, was when a city fell to one side or the other. So if the occupying soldiers were, you know, the side that you weren't on, um, you could expect uh, to not be treated well. And as I said, that went that went the whole gamut from, hey, so we're going to occupy your, your house. You can go starve in the woods to summary execution and then everything in between. Uh, and oftentimes, even outside of places being conquered, um, the situation becoming more and more desperate because supplies would be dwindling. Um, so the women will band together and create basically local aid societies uh, to help each other. You know, you would, again, it'd be somewhat like the way the farmers were anyway, where they would help each other. Um, they would essentially specialize and each farm would do as much of one thing as they could and they would trade amongst themselves. Um, But in this case, they would also pool the resources. So if like one of the group were to say have a crop failure or something, or a, say a medical uh, emergency, they would work together so that that person wouldn't just like die alone in the woods. Anyway, here's the British burning down New York City. Very flammable New York City. Okay. Now, while all this is going on, the Continental Congress and the various colonies um, 
had to kind of decide where things would go politically. So they drafted the Articles of Confederation in 1777, uh, sent them to each of the states, I guess you'd say now, the colonies, states. Technically, state is a broad term. Um, every governmental entity is a state. Like, the United States of America as a whole is a state because it's, it's a governmental entity. And then each individual state is also kind of a state because they're sort of self-governed. You could also argue like each county kind of does their own thing. But anyway. Um, so eight states ratified it by mid-1778. Um, but it was three more years before Maryland approved the articles. So the, it took a while before each state finally ratified everything. Uh, we'll get into why in a few more slides. And, um, <clears throat> well, we'll talk about the issues of the Articles of Confederation uh, next chapter, actually. That's pretty much the entire next chapter is, yeah, so this was not great. Um, let's move on from that. I mean, the, there's a section in here called Years in Crisis. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, even before independence had officially been declared, states were kicking out royal officials, um, either working off English common law or making their own constitutions. Um, they, were, they feared the centralized power in Britain so oftentimes they had uh, power of the voters and legislator enhanced um, in a decreased executive branch, which again is the cause behind and also the weakness of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the Articles of Confederation basically gives all the power to the states and the federal government is barely there, uh, which makes getting anything done very difficult which I know, look at the government today, it's like, well, they don't get anything done anyway. It's like, yeah, that, but worse. Uh, Virginia made a sort of Bill of Rights. Again, this is not the federal constitution or the federal Bill of Rights. That comes later. That's what replaces the Articles of Confederation. Um, but these are ideas that each state came up with on their own because, again, the states were extremely independent and could kind of do their own thing. So Virginia uh, had uh, this Bill of Rights, freedom of the press, elections, trial by peers, formations of militias. Uh, other states included uh, freedom of speech, bearing arms, equal protection of body laws. So in some states you'd have more freedom than you would in others or in some states you were more protected by the law than you were in others. Uh, New Jersey enfranchised all inhabitants who met certain property qualifications, which meant that single or widowed women who had property and free blacks who had property were able to vote in local and state elections, which I wouldn't say it was entirely accidental. It does get reversed later, because obviously. But um, this meant that some women and some African Americans could vote in New Jersey in like the 1700s, at least for a little while. So, progress, sort of? I mean, again, it gets reversed, so I can't really call it progress, but loophole progress? <laughs> anyway, here's our Articles of Confederation, retro union between the states of blah, 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 blah. Uh, speaking of the disenfranchised, oh, hey. 
speaking of some progress, uh, Vermont in 1777 abolished slavery in its constitution, like from the start. It's like, hey, you know, we're Vermont. We don't need agricultural slaves, so we're just going to say none at all. Uh, Pennsylvania, since they were further south and did have some use for agricultural uh, labor, um, they did at least push for gradual abolition. So slaves born after 1780 would be freed once they reached the age of 28. Um, which, I mean, in terms of like average age of an enslaved human being is kind of up there, but I mean, it's something. Uh, in Massachusetts, there were two slaves that sued for their freedom. Um, Mumbet, who later renamed herself Elizabeth Freeman, uh, won her case before her, her case came second, but she ended up getting her case done first. I, I, there's a whole lot to this, and we're not going to get into the whole thing. Um, but anyway, the, the point being, because of the way the laws worked, uh, this now created a legal precedent within Massachusetts and made slavery incompatible with the state constitution. So by technicality, it was now illegal in Massachusetts because that's how court cases work. Obviously, no state south of Pennsylvania made any move to abolish slavery. You know, once you get south of Pennsylvania, it's just, well, 400,000 of the 450,000 slaves in North America were in the south. So, you know, they're not in any real hurry. And conditions actually got worse for uh, those enslaved during the war. Um, since the British were offering them freedom if they escaped and went to aid the British, uh, so the southern slave owners um, <clears throat> did their best to prevent them escaping, which meant harsher punishments for basically anything. It's like, oh, you look like you were thinking about escaping. Time to, like, break your legs. Um, however, those that did join the British um, were often just left when the British uh, forces pulled out, which did not go especially well for them when the uh, when the especially the Southern Patriot forces arrived there. They were either executed on the spot or simply recaptured. However, uh, British commanders like Lord Dunmore in Virginia uh, and Sir Henry Clinton, General Sir Henry Clinton, um, did do their best to carry some of the free slaves that had fought with them uh, back to England where they could have some semblance of freedom. And despite all this, uh, the revolution did deal a blow to the institution of slavery because it, it brought it into question for the first time in, well, North Americans history, as far as the Europeans were concerned. Um, he was like, oh, we want freedom. It's like, what about the people who are literally slaves? Um, in the North, there were entire free black communities, especially in the seaport cities. Thousands of uh, slaves in the South were gaining freedom. Uh, obviously, though, as far as the Continental Congress was concerned, it wasn't a big enough issue to worry about. 
uh, to actually like put into writing because they were busy worrying about their own hides. And also most of the founding fathers were slave owners. George Washington was, Thomas Jefferson was, just to name two of the bigger ones. They're like, oh, well, George Washington freed his slaves. It's like, yeah, in his will, when he died, it's like, oh, you can be free once I'm gone. And the less said about Thomas Jefferson, the better. Anyway, um, so some of the uh, state statutes are uh, emancipation, again, Vermont there, 1777, Massachusetts, 1780, that was with the, um, the Bumbit case. Again, Maine was part of Massachusetts, so don't worry about that. Maine becomes its own thing later. In the uh, gradual emancipation in those other states, and then we'll talk about Louisiana Purchase later. So, the thing that... Uh, the Continental Congress was far more concerned about at the time was France. Um, they had a lot of well, they had a lot riding on an alliance with France because France was one of the biggest empires out there, and they have hated England since 1066. Um, and if they helped us, that'd be good. <laughs> um, France is a financial and a major financial military power. Uh, as as I said, France and England have hated each other forever. I mean, I literally found a video back when I was teaching my 103 class when we talked about the Norman invasion in 1066 and the dude was talking about it like it had happened 30 years ago and the Normans killed his grandfather like he was so emotional it's like dude it was a thousand years ago you need to relax it's like this is where democracy ended it's like there was no democracy under the Anglo-Saxons what's wrong with you um, still though um, defeating the British would be good for France because Britain had a whole lot of power following the Seven Years War um, but you didn't just like idly declare a war on a peer nation in Europe I mean it felt like they did it felt like they were declaring war on each other all the time but if we were actually learning European history um there was a lot of details behind why they were going to war all the time. There was there was something something that um, that triggered each war. Uh, still, though, France was sending military supplies to the colonies as early as even 1775 because they were like, "Hey, even if we're not going to directly get involved, we're at least going to make things harder for the British." They always do that. I mean, they were sending guns to the Irish, like, all the time, because the Irish were always fighting the, the British. And after 1776, as we mentioned, the Continental Congress sent Ben, ben Franklin to France. Um, but it wasn't until Saratoga that France um, was willing to talk about an alliance. The reason for that is you don't uh play too much Star Trek online. There's a there's an old saying. Um one does not fight in a burning house. Uh 
Which is to say, France wasn't going to join the colonies in this war if the colonies couldn't put up a fight on their own. They're not going to join into a war that they're going to lose because that's just going to cost them more money in the long run. But if it looks like the colonies can at least even out against the British, the French can come in and push it over for the, for the side of the colonies. You know, if you see two people fighting and you want one of them to win, but that one is getting the crap beat out of him, you probably don't want to get involved because you're going to get the crap beat out of you too. But if they're pretty even, then you can step in and, and make a difference. So, um, France allied with the colonies. Uh, Britain declared war on France, and technically also Spain, because Spain was allied with France. So, they're both getting involved. And Spain hates Britain too, so why not? Um, however, this immediately shifted it from just being in North America to being into another global conflict. This is the, the curse of imperialism, is now everybody's fighting everywhere all at once. Um, so they were fighting in Gibraltar, West Africa, and the West Indies. And with Britain, basically fighting alone against now not just their rowdy colonies, but two peer empires. Well, okay, the the peer empire of France and also Spain. Um, sorry, Spain. Uh, the British had to now go from spending four million pounds in 1775 to 20 million pounds by 1782. And that's per year, not just total. And obviously go up total, but no, that's per year. Uh, France being a full-fledged empire and professional, having professional armies, not just like, hey, so we're a colony and we want to have our own thing. Uh, they brought in officers, weapons, funds, a navy, which we didn't have at all. Um, that one map for Boston sort of implied we had some pirates that were helping us, but that was about it. We didn't have any kind of navy. Um, Spain had New Orleans as a port and also um, was still in Florida, so they pushed up from Florida and uh, struck out against the British in the southern states. We're actually going to have a lot going on um, around New Orleans and along the Mississippi uh, going forward because of Spain. So yeah, I do joke about Spain, and I will continue to joke about Spain because it's Spain. But um, they were pretty important, at least in the West. So uh, this, this new influx of professional troops, supplies, um, a navy, which again, we didn't have at all. So uh, England was sitting pretty with their navy. Um, Lord North of Britain pulled back into New York um, as their stronghold because they were now uh, no longer just strolling around the colonies as they pleased. And I found this, this gift that said it all. And I found this like in the middle of the summer before I had gotten it, before I had completed these notes like two years ago. And uh, I had to hold on to it, but it's, it's perfect. Like, oh, we're fighting for independence. Yeah, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's like, well, we're fighting the British. It's like, oh, well, we're very enthusiastically on board. Because, you know, we hate the British a lot. So, um, <laughs> there was an immediate problem though. Uh, since we were now allied with another major power in Europe that 
was roughly the same strength as England, uh, a lot of people in America were like, okay, cool, we don't need to fight. So there were fewer people volunteering to fight for the colonies. They're like, all right, well, France has got this. You know, we, we've already got, you know, our generals out there doing their thing, and the French are sending in their troops. So, yeah, we're good. Um, and also not just because, like, people felt like the French could handle it. I'm almost out of Staples again. I am almost out of Staples again. Um, men were captured and became prisoners of war, uh, often brought back to New York, um, or simply placed in prisoner ships, typically in, um, in the waters off of New York. And the prisoner ships were not a good place to be. Uh, as I've mentioned multiple times before, you didn't want to be in a ship long term. It was really bad for your health. And uh, between 8,000 and 11,500 prisoners of war simply died in these prison camps, or not even camps really, these prisoner ships, um, which was more than were killed fighting the British. So you were you were safer on the battlefield getting shot at by the British than you were if you got captured by the British. And also, as far as trying to maintain uh, the war footing, and this is going to be an issue going forward, uh, the Continental Congress could not tax the colonies because it was not an official central government. Um, so they had to take loans from France, the Netherlands, and basically donations from, well, not even donations, it was loans from wealthy patriots. They had to pay them back later, which again, is going to cause issues. Um, so they printed money in the colonies, known as colonials, um, or sorry, continentals. Uh, paper money. <laughs> um, I did a whole thing while I was in grad school, basically helping one of my professors writing a book and uh, going through sources and finding stuff for them. And it was basically on this. It was on like primary source documents when it came to paper money. And it was pretty much across the board, people hated the idea of paper money. Uh, because if you had a dollar, and it's like, this is worth a dollar, but that dollar in, say, silver is somewhere else, um, doesn't, isn't quite the same as, here's a silver dollar, a coin, and it's worth the dollar of silver that it's made out of, physically, right here in my hand. Um, so the, the idea of the paper money did not catch on. And um, by 1780, 100 continentals were required to buy a single silver dollar. Uh, yeah, paper, paper money, fiat currency was not popular. I mean, it, it's still, it's still kind of dumb, but I mean, money is concept anyway, but whatever. Uh, in January of 1779, there were riots in Philadelphia over high prices and low wages. Uh, by October, militiamen joined the protest. This is where things get real bad. <laughs> when the, uh, the people who are supposed to be like quieting the protest are joining in. Uh, they marched in the house of James Wilson, who's a lawyer that sided with the merchants. They rioted for hours. Fifty militiamen were arrested, uh, but they later distributed food because, I mean, people are starving in Philadelphia, the supposed capital of this new nation they're trying to fight for. Um, not going so well. So... We took a $6 million loan from France to try to back the certificates to the various wealthy patriots we took loans from 
begin with, and also the, uh, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later too, the, um, the back pay for all the soldiers that have been doing the fighting, because a lot of that was like, they didn't get paid as like monthly or weekly or whatever, it was, I will pay you at the end of the war, and then as the war was getting close, it's like, oh God, we don't have any money. Here, take the certificate. We'll get to you later. Here's an IOU. Um, now, states were able to tax their citizens. Um, and they did have their own, like, state paper money, which, again, was a little bit weird if you did any kind of traveling. So, like, if you were here in South Carolina, you had South Carolina paper money. But if you went to North Carolina, you'd have to exchange it for North Carolina paper money and the exchange rate was different, like how national currency is, it was, it was a mess. I mean, for the average person, it didn't really matter because you never like left your hometown. But for like merchants, it was a pain in the ass. Um, and it wasn't long before people started uh, becoming very irritated about these taxes because that was like one of the things that they were having this whole revolution about to begin with were lots of taxes they didn't want. Now granted it was more about the representation and whatever, but there's no Congress yet, so like technically they're just being taxed because we're still in a war. I mean here's a $20 uh, Continental, 1775. So 1775, it was worth $20. By 1780, it was worth like 20 cent. Gotta love money depreciation. And see, that's, well, that's part of what inflation is. It's not so much that um, prices go up, it's just the, it's that the uh, value of the money goes down. And here's some of the riots in Philadelphia. Dude's getting shanked there on the ground. Um, I don't know what's happening with the guy at the left. Looks like he's pulled a uh, straight white out of the ground. Everybody's packing swords. Uh, lady up here. Where's my mouse? Mouse. Oh, hey, you're here. Lady appears like dumping a chamber pot out onto this lady's head who's being pulled out of a window. I don't know what's going on here. Like they're trying to have a, 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 a romantic tryst and she's getting a chamber pot dumped on her head. And if you don't know what's in a chamber pot, um, let's just say they didn't have indoor plumbing at the time. Yes, correct. Anyway. While all this is happening, <laughs> see, let's, let's try and get as close to the end as we can. We still got a, a little bit of time yet. Um, Congress wanted to try to settle things with the natives, but also settle land claims. But trying to settle land claims and also be friendly with the natives were two opposite ends of the same problem. And Patriot leaders like, hey, if we manage to become independent of England, we're going to expand westward. And they were like, hey, we don't want that because you're just going to start taking our land and murdering us. That's kind of been the pattern so far. Uh, so in the south, the, um, the major... I suppose you'd say antagonist to the colonist was the uh, Cherokee uh, war chief Dragon Canoe. Um, his sister Nancy Ward or uh, Nani He uh, was actually sympathetic to the Patriots' cause. That's a whole. There's a whole lot of writing on that. Um, 
there was a lot of Western land that had been claimed by the states. I've got a map for this because it's kind of hard to envision, and even looking at the map, it's real confusing as to what they were thinking. Um, but yeah, a lot of the land in the West had been claimed by the Eastern states, and they were planning on giving up this land as reward to the soldiers because, in part, they didn't have any money. Uh, Maryland, however, didn't have any land claimed, so they, this is why they held off on agreeing to the Continental Congress, or not the Continental Congress, I can't words. The um, Articles of Confederation um, so they said, well, they'll agree to the Articles of Confederation um, if the land is made common property for Congress to parcel out into free and independent governments which is to say separate states as opposed to just extensions of current states. Which I don't know if that would have meant like we would have just had long states. <laughs> like if we just had long South Carolina or long Pennsylvania. Um, I'll show you guys in just a little bit. So these states ceded their land and after this, that's when Maryland ratify the Articles of Confederation. Um, but it was this promise of using the Western lands, quote, uh, for the common benefit of the United States, which meant that it was going to not be to the benefit of the natives that already lived there, um, that ensured we were going to have further conflict with the natives. And again, that's going to be like half of the rest of the semester is just conflict with natives because of this. Uh, here's that weird map. Um, so, Jesus. All right. Where's my mouse? All right. So, this whole section was originally Virginia's. But then this was Massachusetts, this was Connecticut's, but also everything here in green was New York's. Um, also, there's some more stuff of Virginia's. This one kind of makes sense. Um, there's North Carolina's. That would become Tennessee. You can, I mean, you can see the, the shape there of Tennessee. Um, we gave Georgia that. I mean, we we didn't have much. We had a stri a strip. Georgia had all this. Um, Spain had had that, which they'll ask for later. Uh, but yeah, just like long. And Maryland didn't have anything, and they were not happy about it. The only uh, image I could find was like this children's book. And that really horrible turkey buzzard right there in the middle. Anyway, we are getting near the end, which will be perfect for doing the review on Monday. So. Let's get a little further. We've got still 15 minutes or so. Um, there were still battles in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys, regardless of who claimed what. I mean, it's a war. You, you, you don't really worry too much about who, who has what you're fighting. Um, so the British forces and their native allies uh, were hitting the Spanish and Americans there. Um, there wasn't a lot of coordination on the side of the Americans, but it kind of worked. We had George Rogers Clark. Uh, he was just like a Virginian surveyor. Um, but he did push against the natives and reinforce the French and Spanish allies and then led a surprise attack at Vincennes? Vincennes? Uh, is it French? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, just this surveyor dude that managed to get stuff done. Um, 
The British kept Detroit, but um, the British native force that hit St. Louis uh, was repelled by Spanish forces, which meant that the um, Americans maintained control over the Ohio River Valley. Uh, meanwhile, we had General John Sullivan, who just murdered a whole bunch of natives, led troops against the Mohawk, Seneca, Cayuga, and uh, Onondaga tribes. Um, Patriots had continued attacking natives, including a massacre of more than 100 Delaware men, women, and children, uh, despite the Delaware tribe having uh, converted to Christianity, Christianity and declaring themselves neutral. And while this certainly would not be the end of conflict between the natives and American settlers, um, this did at least uh, have leave control of the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys to uh, America and their French and Spanish allies. I don't know if I talk about this on the desk at all, honestly. But it's in the book, so it should at least be mentioned. There's, um, this is apparently the Battle of St. Louis. Dude's just like fighting in the fields with freaking farm tools while you've got a tower back there shooting cannons at you. Yeah, no thanks. <coughs> There's Major General John Sullivan, the, uh, the native murderer. Speaking of which, there he is bravely murdering natives. You know, look how look how dangerous they are. All right. Let's talk about what's going on in the South. So uh the southern United States in the revolution was largely loyalist, so the British didn't have too hard of a time capturing major cities. Uh, they hit Savannah in 1778, took control of Georgia. Um, General Clinton was called North to reinforce um, Howe's position, so they left Savannah to Lord Charles Cornwallis. Uh, he retook Charleston in 1780. Uh, Loyalists pushed out from Charleston and overran South Carolina. So we had uh, Bannister Tarleton, um, slaughter civilians and surrender patriots because, you know, we get a little war crimes on both sides. Um, which led to Thomas Sumter taking the high ground and slaughtering Loyalist civilians near Hanging Rock, South Carolina. So, you know, war crimes for everybody. So General Gates, who had been at Saratoga, uh, went south to try to help the Continental Forces, was defeated by Cornwallis in Camden, um, around the same time that they discovered uh, Benedict Arnold's betrayal. Uh, Benedict Arnold um, was in charge, I can't remember the name of the fort, and in my notes from my professor, when I didn't have these notes ready, um, it was a lot more detailed, but basically he was in charge of a fort in New York State um, that controlled the uh, entrance to the Hudson River, and he gave it to the British because his wife was like pro-loyalist, and he decided to go with her, and it, it didn't really work out for him, and it wasn't like it was a big shock for the American forces because Benedict Arnold was such a great general for us. Um, but he wasn't exactly like hailed as a hero when he got to Britain or anything. Um, however, Ma Major Patrick Ferguson was routed at Kings Mountain, uh, which was good for the Continentals. 
So General Nathaniel Green, again, from the Green Mountain Boys. Um, no, sorry, Ethan Allen, Green Mountain Boys. I'm getting the boys mixed up. Uh, Nathaniel Green went down to the place gates, um, and he used the tactics of uh, Daniel Morgan and Francis Marion, who had been doing guerrilla fighting down here the entire time, uh, keeping the, the British occupied. So there was a big battle between the American forces and the British forces at Cowpens. Uh, I think I've actually been to that reenactment, I feel like. Um, before the British technically won the battle at Guilford Courthouse, uh, the Patriot forces had to quit the field, but the British forces suffered massive losses. Um, which, which required Cornwallis to retreat to Yorktown, Virginia um, and await reinforcements from General Clinton, who was still in New York. So the South was kind of a meat grinder. Like at first it went really well for the British, uh, and then you've got weirdos in the woods that just sort of shoot at you all the time. Uh, and then you get regular troops coming down here that learn from the weirdos in the woods to shoot at you all the time. And you've got a lot of people shooting at you in the woods, from the woods all the time. Um, and it's just a big mess. So we've got uh, Savannah. Or was that Charleston? So that was, that, this is Charleston actually. Uh, I believe this is uh, Cornwallis. Looks like Clinton. Charlton and the boys. The, uh, there, there's Tarleton uh, showing the American forces what happens to Americans who surrender. They get shanked. This guy getting shot off a horse. The horse is not having a good time. Uh, I believe this is King's Mountain. The uh, British troops getting routed. Pens didn't go as well, uh, but technically it went okay for the, the Patriots. Um, oh no, that's, dang, that was supposed to be Calpins. I can't keep these up. This was Guilford Courthouse, which was the final, um, the final major fight in the South. Okay, let's do one more slide because we're like right here at the end. Um, and then we'll finish it off on Monday. So we had Yorktown. This is like basically the end of the war, uh, at least as far as the war is concerned. Final major battle of the war, uh, Washington working with French allies, which is to say uh, Company Rochambeau, uh, marching south from Rhode Island. Uh, General Lafayette is pushing on the shore. French naval vessels moving up from the West Indies to cut off the British there. Uh, so uh, Cornwallis was completely uh, surrounded in Yorktown. Uh, he surrendered on October 19, 1781 uh, because the reinforcements he was promised never showed up. I don't remember if it was because Clinton was busy with other things or if he was actually cut off due to like French forces. Now, technically, this was the end of the war, but it took two years to actually put together uh, a peace treaty. We'll talk about that next time. Um, British colonial soldiers 
were still like challenging each other over territory because there was a lot of back and forth. Um, troops were discharged without back pay, which caused 300 men to march on Philadelphia. Um, Washington troops met them. Washington's troops met them there, but rather than shooting them because, well, we'll get there next semester with World War One. Um, they agreed to half pay because you know it's Washington. We did finally get the Treaty of Paris. It was signed on September 2nd, 1783, which I would argue should be what we'd celebrate for the thing, because that's when the treaty was signed. Um, but the Comte de Vergennes, the French foreign minister, uh, he opposed Americans' Republican principles because France was still like this extremely powerful monarchy. Um, and they didn't consider the delegates as political equals. They're like, oh, well, you know, we should have a, be a bigger say in what America does. And obviously our delegates are like, no, it's our country. Um, so it took two freaking years. Um, and our new uh, territories, so we got all land south of Canada down to Florida and all the way west to the Mississippi River. Um, we also gave Spain Florida back because A, Spain helped us in the war, and B, why do you want Florida? It's full of alligators and mosquitoes. Like, yeah, so there's Yorktown. There's the siege of Yorktown here. Totally surrounded. Uh, here's the mutiny of the Pennsylvania line. Dude's got double flintlock pistols ready to go. And this is the new, uh, the new boundaries. So there's still some area up in Maine that Britain's not budging on. There's that stripe there uh, between Spain and American lands, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, yeah, we'll finish up next time. See y'all next week. Look over your study guide this weekend so that we can get through it all on Monday. I'm going to mute you guys. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go over the study guide on Monday. Uh, we've got like a, a slide left. Um, yeah, and just please send in your papers via email at my rally.holt at fmarion.edu, please. Um, preferably as a, an attached Word document, or PDF is fine too. Um, the Google Docs share doesn't always work, so that's... Not great. Don't do that, please. Um, if you have to, it's fine. It is just an extra step. I won't. I won't like not accept it. But it's just extra work for me. Less work, the better. Because I've got a lot of papers to do this this semester. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll talk to y'all on Monday. Bye for now.